Hi everybody, today let's talk about the Victorian program for the 491 and 190 visa in the last financial year. My name is Tracy Chen and welcome back to my channel, My Great Australian Dream. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the principal lawyer at Mason Chen Law Group. We are based all around Australia. I have lawyers and agents that are working in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Brisbane. So I'll leave our contact details in the link below. So it's been a big year for skilled migration, so many ups and downs, and we're coming towards the end of most migration programs. Today, I wanna to talk about the Victorian migration program specifically, what my, some of my findings are, and what we can expect for the next year. basing this kind of on trends, what's happened the previous year, and kind of just, you know, the overall feel of the program. So as we all know, the process for this is a little bit different to every other state. I'll talk through the exact steps of each process in a minute, but basically what you do for the Victorian Skilled Migration Program, whether it be the 190 or the 491, the first thing you have to do is lodge an expression of interest on Skill Select. Now in that skill select, you would select 190 or 491. To be honest, you could probably select both. Uh, but if you are specific about which visa type you are applying for, then you may as well just pick one. Make sure in that expression of interest, you obviously pick Victoria. The next thing you do, you have to actually lodge a registration of interest, which is actually attached to the expression of interest, kind of. So you open an account on the portal, it's called Live in Melbourne. And I've had a few technical issues with this uh, website throughout the year. So if you are ever working on this and you run into technical issues, don't worry. It's actually quite normal. You can email the technical support team and they're really good. They will respond in like, you know, 24 hours, maybe 48. But I've had a very good experience with that this year. So you go in and you submit a registration of interest. You submit your details in there. And you also have to write a little summary on, you know, what you do, who you work for. And then you also have to answer a third question, which this year I'll talk about a little bit later was about, you know, your talent and contributions to your field. Then once you are selected, you'll get a pre-invite, kind of like a registration of interest invite. And you have to lodge the proper nomination form. In that nomination form, they will check all the details that you claimed in your original registration of interest and your expression of interest. So technically all three things need to match, obviously. And then once that's approved, your nomination, you'll be selected. You basically are nominated for the 190 or 491 visa in Victoria. And you'll see in your skill select, it will be locked. And when you log into your skill select, your expression of interest, it will just say apply now, which leads to your IMI account, which then you'll fill in your details for the application form. And then there'll be more things for you to upload and, and enter into that form. And that's when the Department of Immigration, the federal kind of side, the federal team will assess all your documentation. So even though you have the pre-invite nomination and all of that, it's all taking the right pathway and you're all on the right track, but things can still go wrong right until the end of the visa approval. So make sure it's all consistent all the way around. So what I'm gonna do now is quickly break down all four of these steps, talk about the program in general, and explain to you in detail. Okay, so first of all, your expression of interest. Your expression of interest includes all your details, your study history and your work history. Obviously, the expression of interest has to meet the state nomination requirements. But let's just talk about the basics of the expression of interest. So you've got your name, your passport, your date of birth, your details about your partner, about whether you can claim points uh, as having your partner on the application as well, or whether you are single. Then you look at education history, um, if you studied a bachelor, if you studied in Australia, if you studied a master's by research, you can all get extra points for those parts. Lastly, they'll look at your work history, your work history from overseas and your work history from here in Australia. Again, if you are claiming points for work experience, it has to be post qualification. And I know that the confusing part is, you know how some skills assessment have the date deemed skilled? It's actually not a thing in all the other states. It's just New South Wales that, you know, care about the date deemed skilled. So you've got to enter in the date deemed skilled. But for our firm, after this whole thing happened with New South Wales and them only accepting date deemed skilled um, on the application, we did it as a blanket rule for all our clients, just in case we've lodged an expression of interest for another state and then they suddenly change again. 
So we just did it as an all over blanket rule for now. But technically speaking, if you already lodged and you didn't use a date deem skill, you base it on post qualification, your application should be fine. But again, you should probably get some proper, you know, migration advice in regards to that because it gets a bit tricky depending on the occupation, the skills assessing body, um, where you studied, you know, all of that stuff. It actually all makes a difference. Then lastly, obviously, you can claim points for your English. You can claim points for your NATI. I think the Victorian program was quite competitive this year from a skills perspective, from a talent perspective and a points perspective. So, you know, either way, when my clients go, you know, do I need seven each for English or do I need eight each? I always say to them, yeah, look, you need the eight in each band superior if you can get it because anything that you can do to improve your application is going to help. So. I always tell my clients, you know, try to aim for the superior English. And to be honest, most people have been okay to secure the eight in each band. You know, it is what it is. It's just more competitive these days. So the next section or part of the form we'll talk about is your registration of interest. Now, to be able to apply for a registration of interest, you first got to qualify. Now, it changed this year. So the previous financial year was different. This year, it changed. I don't know if they're going to change it next year, but let's talk about a little bit about the comparisons. Last financial year from memory for the 491 to qualify, you had to be living and working in Victoria for three months before you can apply in a target sector. For the 190, you had to be living and working anywhere in Victoria for six months before you can apply. Um, obviously, you need to be working in a target sector and using your STEM skills. So this is last financial year. Okay, so this is 2020 and 2021. This financial year, it changed. Again, we had prepared the best we could for this financial year. But then, you know, we had everything ready. And then when they opened the program, it changed. They changed the questions. They had to redraft everything. So this year, we're probably going to do things a little bit differently. So anyways, this year for the 491, you just had to be living and working in regional Victoria. There was no minimum working time or living time. And the same thing for 190, there was no minimum living or working time. It could be casual work. You know, there was no minimum about 20 hours per week like the previous year. I quite like that because it just gets confusing when you're talking about three months or six months. You know, I saw people who came to me when they lodged their own registration of interest the year before and they didn't quite meet 20 hours per week and they lodged it and then they got a refusal and then they got a ban. And then there was some people who, you know, the, the hours didn't quite add up or something like that and they got a refusal on that basis. This year has been a lot cleaner because of that. And also because previous year, when you're lodging six months worth of pay slips, I think there's a lot of paperwork for the case officer too. So, you know, so hopefully they do keep that the same this year. You know, you have to be working in target sector, using your STEM skills, but there's no minimum working requirement. So next, let's talk about STEM skills. to be using your STEM skills. A lot of people are like, you know, oh, is my occupation on the list? Well, actually there is no really occupation list. There is a very broad occupation list for the 190 and 491 visa from the Department of Home Affairs, but Victoria strictly didn't. So by a rule of thumb, STEM skills use science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. If you kind of fall into these five areas of your occupation, you're on the right track. So, you know, doctors, nurses, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, scientist, IT occupations such as ICT business analyst, um, you know, a cybersecurity specialist. You kind of fall into, you know, that criteria there. You know, it was really weird when the program opened. They had this seminar and people were asking, you know, does an accountant fall in? And they said, no, it doesn't. Um, but last year, to be honest, we got a fair few accountants that were invited. However, they were working in the specific target sectors. So obviously they look at, you know, what you do, the background and everything. So we had, you know, accountant that was working in a hospital, you know, accountants are working in regional for a lot of big regional businesses. So it kind of varies. So next, let's talk about target sector. So what was really important about Victoria is that you had to be working in a target sector. So I didn't have the computer in front of me, but it was like the target sectors was like health, digital, advanced manufacturing, life sciences, agri-food. Oh, you're testing me now. Oh, um, new energy and, you know, um, reducing of emissions and, and, all, and those things. And those were the target sectors from memory. But this is what I actually found from the program. They really do have specific target sectors within those target sectors that they look clearly at. So I'll give you an example. Under the digital sector, if you have a look, they've got health tech, med tech, robotics, 
you know, automation and all of that. I tell you, they really, really liked applicants who are working in digital games and cybersecurity. It was a big area for them. So I found that, you know, applicants who are working in those areas, if they were, you know, didn't have as high points or, you know, they didn't come from the, a, a really large company, they were still selected. Whereas, you know, with ICT business analysts who may be still working in one of the target sectors, such as, you know, um, digital infrastructure, the ones that got selected came from really, really big companies, had a great profile um, and had a great, you know, registration of interest. I think it was more competitive for them. So for those who are, you know, kind of working in digital games, cybersecurity space and all of that, I would definitely say go for this. It's a great opportunity for you. So, yeah, one of the things that I found was that those who worked in large companies, um, with you know a great company structure I think there were more of them that were selected again obviously a lot of people in the healthcare industry was selected a lot of people wanted to put their application under health even if they were doing more projects in other areas and you know they're working had a few projects in health but do remember if you're putting under health health is probably the most competitive you're up against all the you know nurse if you're in IT but you're up against doctors and nurses my worry would only just be, yeah, it's a great application, but because so many, you know, would you be lost within that? So that's something you need to strongly consider as well. So let's talk about the points. So with the points, I think it was very random. Yes, I feel like it was a little bit more competitive than last year, but that's not saying that people with less points weren't selected. But obviously you had to make up for it somewhere. So if you had less points, then you definitely need to have a lot more talent, which would need to be displayed in your registration of interest. When you're writing your registration of interest, you know, you really need to talk about your education, your experience, and what you're currently contributing. I think the registration of interest is a lot of work and you do have to present the best one forward, but at the same time, don't overthink it. I had some people who were going back and forth with drafts for so long, and I said to them, hey, look, this is good enough. Let's just submit it. Let's not also overthink this as well. So please don't overthink this, because at the end of the day, I think these case officers read thousands and thousands and thousands of applications. You just need to have something that will make you stand out. It's only 1,500 characters. So you don't, you just have to say the one thing that makes you stand out and that's it. You don't need to make every single sentence, you know, have so much information and long, difficult words for them to read and all of that. I don't think it's really important. So that's your registration of interest. When you are selected, you got your pre-invitation, you lodge your nomination and basically all the supporting documents will support everything you claimed on the registration interest. When you started to work, your employment contract, your duties and all of that. So again, if you just did everything correctly from the beginning to the pre-invite to the nomination, it should be a pretty smooth process. You just have to have all the supporting documents from your employer, your employment contracts, your pay slips, everything to back it up. Then lastly, when you are selected, your skill select expression of interest is locked. You get an email like, congratulations, you've been nominated, and then you'll be able to apply for your skilled visa accordingly. So the question is, what's gonna happen next year, the next financial year? Because they are starting to close now. We are starting to see some people who are told they were not successful. We still have a lot of people who are actually still lodged and that we haven't received any response or like fingers crossed for them. But what's going to happen in the new financial year? Again, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. But I know that Victoria is competitive. It is, you know, the state that everybody tries to go to. It is the state that everybody likes to live in and all of that. There's great opportunities there as well. I think that they won't. I think the STEM skill thing will stay. I think like a lot of other states, they like the STEM skills and, you know, working in the target sector because that's just where they want to grow with their economy. I do think to some level they will maintain all of that. There'll probably be a little bit of changes to target sectors, but I don't think anything major because those industry sectors are really core for the growth of Victoria. And a lot of people come to me and they're like, so, so should I move? You know, should I move to South Australia? Should I move to New South Wales? Should I move to Melbourne? Well, my answer is if you've got a job in a target sector using your STEM skills, so for example, you're, I don't know, um, a mechanical engineer working for a big agri-food business like Beaker Cheese in Victoria. I don't know, I just made that up, sorry. <laughs> Beaker Cheese in Victoria, you know, I wouldn't be moving because you meet the criteria. Why would you move to another state and live and work in regional, you know, just for that? We just have to work a little bit harder for your application and we can get there. And a lot of people, you know, did get 
the not rejection letter but just told they weren't successful this round and a lot of them felt disheartened from that it's it is just the way it is you weren't selected this round you may get selected next round so i had clients honestly that have been with me since 2020 and 2021 financial year who weren't selected and guess what they were selected this year and i'll and they can definitely vouch for that so don't be disheartened for that. The main thing is like, do you meet the target sectors? Do you meet the criteria? If you do, just hold on a little bit longer. It will come. Okay, guys. So thank you so much for watching. I hope that was really helpful for you guys to make a decision about moving forward into this financial year and where you'll be going. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share this with people who need it. I'll leave a link below in the comment section on how to contact us below. But thank you very much. And I'll see you guys in the next video.